subscribe to our YouTube channel and press the bell icon to get the latest updates. Hello and welcome to yet another edition of the Print Soft Cover where we virtually launch a new book. This is Nainima Barsu and today I have a riveting account of how the Chinese Communist Party changed the entire narrative on the pandemic to get global dominance dominance over the global uh, affairs now to discuss this book let me first tell you that this also has an interesting title to it which is called the smokeless war smokeless war china's quest for geopolitical dominance it's a bloomsbury publication and the author is there with us mr manoj keval ramani who let me tell you also calls himself the china dude welcome to the print manoj Thank you so much for having me, Nanima. Thank you so much. It's a pleasure to be here. Thank you. Same here. So, Manoj, I'll ask you the usual boring question. I know you came up with the title based on what uh, Chinese Foreign Minister and their State Councillor Wang Yi had once stated uh, in one of his speeches that this is a smokeless war. But you have, uh, you know, you've gone through a huge uh, sort of uh, repository and 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 you know Mandarin sources because you can read those. But I'm sure you have come across several such phrases. Why stick to this only? Smokeless war. Right. So um, I mean, apart from what the Chinese Foreign Minister said, um, very early on into China's sort of pandemic containment activities, they referred to this entire process of containing the spread of COVID-19 as a wartime effort and a war without smoke, because that's the kind of effort that you need. Although there are no guns and bombs involved. Uh, and that sort of allowed you to, and for the leadership to then frame uh, the narrative for the elites, for the public. It allowed a certain kind of mobilization of resources. It allowed uh, an effort, and it sort of also informed the party. Uh, and Xi Jinping said this earlier in February that this is a people's war. Uh, and so it sort of also indicated that this is going to be protracted. Uh, you're going to need all hands on board. You're going to need to keep the people by your side. Uh, and come what may, you need to maintain that posture for a long period of time. It also sort of therefore whips elites in shape who might be grumbling over what's happening. Um, now, to me, the sort of narrative of the smokeless war fit very well because it was not just a wartime effort of containment, but it was also a sort of upping the ante on discourse. Uh, and that sort of, and Xi Jinping has previously, and even official Chinese documents have called the sort of discourse space a battlefield, um, and therefore sort of this fit into that because the nature of discourse contestation that we saw going forward, it was sort of like a war of words, uh, and not just words, but also for hearts and minds globally uh, across uh, with different countries that we saw play out over the last year. So therefore, I thought the title sort of fit all of those descriptions very well, and that's why I sort of chose it. So, um, so take our readers through that. Take our viewers as to you know how the ecosystem of this uh, information uh, mechanism in China sort of uh, evolved. Right. I, I think we are observing this today. We are at the cusp of the party celebrating its hundredth anniversary, and there is an information district that's going on right now. Um, and this sort of just tells us a little bit about how the party historically has seen. Uh, the information space is critical. I mean, the propaganda department of the Communist Party was formed well before the Red Army came into being. So it just tells you how important that contestation of ideas was, even to the early leaders in the early 1920s. Um, subsequently, what we saw was that Mao Zedong himself was quite a shrewd person when it came to public communication. He was obviously a tremendous orator, and he could move people in masses. Um, but also he understood that as the world was changing, he needed to engage in discourse competition. He needed to get his voice out there. Uh, and the whole, the entire saga with Edward, uh, you know, Edgar Snow uh, was very, very clear. And it sort of tells you how he understood the desire, the need to shape narrative as a critical tool of gaining legitimacy. And as we've seen subsequently with the formation of the PRC, um, we've seen the sort of line change over time, right? We've seen uh, Mao Zedong initially talking about revolution while also pursuing nationalism. He was not somebody who was averse to engaging with uh, the press internationally. Uh, Deng Xiaoping, of course, after him was much, much more savvy. Uh, he had a clear agenda and he engaged with the press. His visit to the US, the idea of him wearing the cowboy hat and him sort of charming the American audiences 
it tells you that you know chinese leaders over the years have understood the importance of that uh, abroad at least domestically they've understood that it's significant to control the narrative because if you start to lose the narrative then you start to lose legitimacy very very easily and as tools have changed uh, the chinese leadership has become far more adept at controlling the narrative all of us remember that you know bill clinton's comment before he was leaving the presidency about the internet and social media in china and talking about how let's see them nail jello to the wall they've mastered that art in some way uh, they've been so good at it and i think that's uh, outside when people who look at it or people who are pro democracy activists they look at it begrudgingly um, but it's really fascinating to understand that it's not just a process of uh, top down heavy control it's also persuasion it's also cajoling it's also co-opting it's also creating an engaging narrative of the party uh, which is what they did uh, going forward uh, during the pandemic So um I will now draw your attention to one place uh, that you've written in your chapter Heroes and Martyrs that there was a front page commentary in People's Daily where they termed the pandemic as the people's war right in which there must be no bystanders now what was that what led to it and um it you know one year or maybe one and a half years down the line we are all suffering because of that what did they mean that there must be no bystanders i think what they meant was and this uh, uh, before i sort of get to what they exactly meant it's really fascinating to understand how these media outlets in china party state media outlets function their interest is not in what's the most is fascinating new story what's the most relevant new story what's the biggest new story editorially you're not thinking about you you know uh, you're in a news organization you're agonizing on a daily basis about being quick about being correct about you know being objective about being balanced and all those good things that journalism is made out of these guys are not interested in that party state media their interest is what's the party's primary objective and what's the biggest story from a from the party's point of view therefore uh, as you would read in the book that at at very early stages the people's daily which is the party's flagship newspaper just does not cover what's happening in wuhan it just does not talk about it um and there's a point of time where even the lockdown is imposed and that's missing from the front pages of the people's daily where it is the biggest news around the world um yet when the party sort of starts to get its narrative together you start to see uh, far more coverage far more regular coverage and that's very common when it comes to disaster coverage in china that you know the coverage is not from the point of view of what's happening and what the disaster is why it was caused it's about look this has happened and now the party is in control uh, so early february when you see that commentary you see that the party has the party leadership has set a clear line that this is how we're going to approach it and it's basically communicating to everybody within china uh, that this is an extraordinary moment we have to take extraordinary steps that may mean that your liberties of uh, movement your liberties of access to the internet your liberties of access to probably food uh, and travel and all of those things might have to be suspended and extraordinary measures might have to be taken to keep you indoors uh, and you have to be party to that so the idea that there have to be no bystanders is that it's also a message to the private sector right that we need you you need to play a role you can't stay out um and you have to play you have to do the role that we ask of you and i think that's what the party does well in some ways that its ability to mobilize these masses of resources uh is unparalleled in some ways uh, to me and that's what the that commentary was trying to say that you know we need everybody involved all hands on deck and no dissenters no bystanders everybody has a role to play and you must play a role yeah so that's why i think you say that this is a nationalistic clarion call now tell me something when i speak with uh, other you know uh, experts on china and more so because you know we've been uh, engaged in a bitter standoff border standoff with them since april 2020 so you know there is this thing that comes up that within china also when things started to get exposed on the novel coronavirus and the fact that uh, the uhan lab started to come under scanner people within china also started questioning some somewhat but the government was able to really silence that and tell them that look we are back in action the disneyland sort of opened and see the world is suffering so how did they manage that i mean uh, whatever protest or you know the things that started the dissent if you can say so 
how was that silenced and and what were those uh, what were told to them so some of this sort of uh, from late december uh, and some of the research that i documented in the book talks about that from late december you start seeing conversations uh, with regard to uh, an illness you know and you start seeing conversations on social media about you know sharing tips about you know washing your hands eating certain kinds of things something that you will see you know as something that happens if you're a large family uh, in india you know somebody will be telling you uh, have turmeric water have this take steam whatever so you'll see lots of these sort of uh, support measures going on things start to get worse as things uh, as you know the the magnitude of the illness starts to take shape uh, in january um and particularly once the government starts acknowledging that there is something amiss um you see tremendous criticism and of course after the lockdown you see tremendous criticism for a period of 10 to 15 days um in chinese cyber and i days. yeah yeah significantly for 10 to 15 days you see tremendous amount of not criticism. a month i'm saying yeah not a month of course um but what you do see is that uh, you do see that criticism allowed uh, it's not like subsequent criticism is not permitted um but you see at least in those early 10 to 15 days that criticism being freely allowed uh, at a point of time in the book i quote a, a journalist tony lin uh, from forth and he's sort of talking at a podcast and i was fascinated when i heard him make that comment uh, saying that uh, it seemed like that at that point of time the only thing that punctuated talks about this virus and talks about critic- criticizing the government was the death of kobe bryant nothing else punctuated it in chinese cyberspace and the government allowed that to happen um whether it allowed that to happen because there was the holiday season and the censors were taking a break whether it allowed that to happen because they are smart enough to realize that uh, there is a wall of pressure that needs to let be, to, to be allowed to release uh, or whether it thought that it, from the central government's point of view that it's important for some of this to happen so that we understand the magnitude of the crisis because there's also a disconnect often between central leadership and provincial leadership uh in in the chinese system where systemically the provincial leadership will try to sort of conceal the magnitude of crises and pass on good news because you don't you never want to give bad news to your bosses particularly knowing that you're not you may not be in the job for long and you will sort of move on so let the bad news be dealt with the guy after you um so that sort of systemic uh, tension in the chinese party system exists what the chinese party state did well after they sort of did this was firstly they imposed strict lockdowns and they got the virus under control um without that you can't uh, you can't sort of there's only so much that propaganda can do uh, you need to have actual results people need to see their lives getting back to somewhat normal and they did that well they had a model of very strict lockdowns very strict testing uh, you know adapting treatment uh, to trying to deal with the problem and that gradually paid dividends uh, in wuhan and hubei and subsequently they adopted that model in other places also the other thing that they did was that they adopted certain soft and hard measures in terms of propaganda um very early on in early february there's this call for 300 odd journalists chinese journalists to go to hubei and wuhan and to talk about positive stories to talk about how the country is coming together to fight the pandemic i mean you can see a parallel in india where we sort of spoke about corona warriors and you know the government tried to whip up a certain degree of positivity it was very similar you send journalists over there to try and create a positive environment so that people feel that their stories are being reflected uh, and there's hope uh, and they are part of this great effort to combat this unseen evil virus um and that sort of starts to play on your psyche it also shows you that the government is acting um at the same time uh, you saw an effort to try and address the problems in terms of capacity so 24/7 uh, there was a live streaming of the two hospitals that were being built in wuhan Uh, that live stream was available internationally so if you wanted to see chinese engineering at its peak you could see it uh, and that gives a message that the government is working people you know we are doing things to address your problems and we'll soon take care of it um, and the idea that we are building these hospitals in 10 days was a remarkable message that you were sending at the same time there were sort of these hard measures right in early february you saw the chinese cyberspace administration issue a call for sort of having the internet much cleaner taking down dissenters and those sorts of things uh, a few days later around the 10th of february there's another call to sort of be extremely hard on anything that sort of interferes with pandemic work so uh, this sort of began with things like you know crack down on price gouging crack down on uh, other things but it also talks about crack down on rumor mongering which is this nebulous phrase uh, under which you can just take down dissenters 
At the same time, you're cracking down on citizen journalists who are showing you critical views. You're censoring reports which earlier were allowed uh, about things like shortages of beds, you know, uh, people dying because of challenges uh, in hospitals, uh, lack of medicines, price gouging. You're starting to sort of scrub the internet clean also. Um, and those are the sort of mix of hard and soft measures by which you've got the narrative under control. Um, and while, while I say that, I want to sort of reiterate, at the end of the day, if you hadn't got the virus under control, none of this would have sustained. So to give the devil its due, they did manage to do that. And that sort of permitted the rest of this. Um, and of course, subsequent, at the same time, in, in chapter four, I talk about how they also very early on figured out that we need to localize lockdowns and restart the economy. We need to in amplify testing to be able to do that. To be able to test at that scale, we need to invest in manufacturing. So early on from February onwards, they are ramping up manufacturing of masks, kits, tests, all of that, to the point that by March, they are exporting it to the wider world. Um, so they did do a lot of things well, uh, but the propaganda in terms of containing the public anger was a mix of these hard and soft measures. Okay, well, that's, uh, I, I knew it, that it will be a fascinating sort of account that you'll be uh, telling us. But let me also understand, uh, yeah, I mean, all that one has to really read your book, how fascinating it was. But how was it so easy to sell to the people? I mean, when especially the Wuhan lab came under scanner, this is still so much under question. Investigation is on from the American side. Uh, there's so many discussions going on that that is also the reason why China's uh, military had this kind of belligerence. But within, uh, I mean, my point is, are Chinese people really so gullible to understand that just because a live streaming of uh, hospital constructions going on and you know the government is really doing this and yes i admit that they did a fantastic job of controlling the virus but um, still did they not realize that maybe this is the time that we should question uh, what is going on in terms of governance i think there are a couple of things here let me just first look at the lab issue so uh, when this conversation about the lab starts to come out um, and this is also part of the Chinese information response, the government's information response. There's also a sort of disinformation campaign that's running, which I talk about, which, uh, you know, makes this case that, look, uh, maybe this is coming from the Americans. Maybe this is by a war from the Americans. And this sort of exists in cyberspace, sort of unacknowledged it exists. But it sort of gets more official shape in early March 2020 when Zhao Lijian talks about it. Um, I think there's also, you, we also need to look at the fact that uh, by March, um, things were getting bad around the rest of the world. Um, and to be honest, the Chinese leadership sounded fairly sensible. Uh, they had proved, proved, given results. Um, by the time the world was entering lockdowns, Wuhan was reopening, uh, life was going back to normal. So if you look at it from the people's point of view, um, the narrative was also that, look, these democracies or these systems of which, are, which claim that they are democracies, these multi-party systems, they failed. Uh, the American president does not even acknowledge that this is a serious virus. Um, and look at the American response. They are struggling. Look at the Indian response. They are struggling. Uh, look at our response. It has been tremendously efficient. Uh, look at the death toll that's happening happened in China. It's been far lesser. Um, and at the end of the day, when people see that, that's the first thing that they look at. You're looking at outcomes. And you're saying, yes, we went through a difficult time. Uh, yes, it's highly likely that this is a natural virus because nobody would want to believe that their government was doing something like this, which ended up resulting in a leak or which ended up resulting in something escaping a lab. And of course, the evidence for that is very thin. Uh, and to be honest, from an American government point of view, and I document this in the book, through March and April and early May, there is tremendous flip-flop. Uh, there's tremendous talk about certainty that this came from the lab in Wuhan. And then you see Trump saying, we have evidence, Pompeo saying, we have evidence. And a couple of days later, he backs down saying, well, we don't really know. The Office of the Director of National Intelligence says, we are certain this is not man-made. Uh, so there's a lot of flip-flopping. And if I am looking at it as a Chinese national who is seeing that over the last few years, particularly, my country is in sort of existential, increasingly sort of existential conflict where it, it seems to me like the West wants to contain me, particularly the United States. I'm not necessarily going to buy that. Uh, plus, I'm seeing that, look, my government has been able to control this efficiently. My economy has restarted. I've gotten the financial support to start and sort of get back to work. Employment is stabilizing. 
there's a sense that we are far more efficient and we've dealt with this better. Um, and you don't necessarily believe what's coming out because you also acknowledge, and this is part of, again, Chinese propaganda, which has existed for years. Um, under Xi Jinping, it's intensified, where the idea of whipping up nationalism and portraying the foreign threat as something that is deeply problematic to China's rise uh, starts to get internalized. I mean, this is something that started in the 1990s after Tiananmen Square, where you had patriotic education. And under Xi Jinping, this narrative has taken far, far stronger shape. So as a generation that's growing up in that environment, you tend to believe that, look, there is something that's going on around the world where people are uncomfortable with our rise. So we don't necessarily believe all of this. Do you entirely believe your government and say your government is about, above board and it can't be the case that there was something going on in Wuhan? No. But is there enough evidence to tell you that? No. At the same time, uh, you've asked for uh, you've asked for transparency. The Chinese argument is that we've provided you transparency through the WHO. Uh, you've just kept politicizing this thing, and that's limited our engagement. But we've been transparent. The WHO is an international body. It's done this, um, and it's given you this answer. That narrative is easy as easy for people to buy, particularly when you are driven by nationalistic sentiment. Um, and I think that's sort of what's happening. I don't say that there's no skepticism among the Chinese public. Uh, but increasingly, when you look at the world from the point of view even the, of even the Chinese public, you see that there is uh, a contest brewing and you want to sort of be far more supportive of your uh, party in your state at that point of time. Mm -hmm. So, uh, Manoj, tell me about the episode uh, with Dr. Li Wenlian, the 34-year-old ophthalmologist uh, with regarding whom there was a lot of confusion in Chinese media and social media. Uh, tell our viewers about that episode because that sort of really, uh, I believe was the first sign uh, for the world to, uh, to sort of, you know, it would have taken notice what is happening on that. Uh, then probably we wouldn't have seen uh, this, what we are seeing uh, today. So, so just tell us about that episode. Yeah, I mean, I think that's, again, a fascinating tale uh, about how the Chinese system works, how public anger and outcry works, and also how the government can co-opt things. In and a concerted manner. Matters. In a concerted manner, exactly. I mean, obviously, uh, he was one of the doctors who was in that WeChat group where the initial sort of talk of a virus came out. Uh, he was called into the police station. Uh, he was sort of read the riot act and apologized. Uh, and subsequently, once this became public knowledge, there was quite a bit of public outrage, uh, particularly after it was clear that this is a virus and the government in Wuhan uh, and the local party bosses in Wuhan tried to hush things down, thinking that this might go away or because they had political priorities with regard to the provincial party congress that they had to hold before the National Party Congress, uh, before the National People's Congress in March. So what you ended up seeing was that Liu and Liang began to sort of acquire this cult-like status because after all of that, he went back to work. Uh, he had a young kid. Uh, he went back to work and he uh, eventually contracted the virus and he eventually died in early February. Um, there was such an outpouring and his comments before he died, I mean, he gave interviews in which he spoke about how there's a need to be far more transparent. Um, and I think those struck a chord. I mean, it struck a chord with people across China because at that point of time, the anger was so intense. Uh, with regard to the failure of the party state leadership. Um, again, one of the things that we need to keep in mind is that in China, the central leadership just traditionally tends to enjoy far greater popular legitimacy uh, and popular support than local leadership uh, because people deal with the local leadership much more and people have far more confidence in central leadership. And likewise, as the central leadership sort of takes charge in this, in the, in this entire episode, what you see is uh, that... Uh, the people start to be very critical of the local leadership and the central leadership imposes costs on them. It sacks people, it demonstrates that it's taking action and it shows that now we are in control. And some of this is evident in Fang Fang's writing, which I quote, where she at one point of time says that now these guys have come in, okay, we need to live with the system, but now we know that because the central leadership is here, things will be done. Um, so that sentiment also exists. Once the day Liu and Liang passed away was a day of tremendous confusion because there were initial reports that he's died. Uh, and then there was this visual from the hospital of him still being alive, but on treatment on the bed. Uh, and the report was pulled down. And it seemed like they were trying to figure out what we should do because you knew that when that information got out, there's going to be uh, sort of an outpouring of grief and anger on social media. Uh, and sort of you don't know how the public eventually reacts. And I think in large measure, Chinese government's sort of approach to containing some of this is 
that you can have anger angst uh, opposition on social media and other places as long as it can it has the potential to not mobilize once it has the potential to mobilize people you are worried so anything which has a contagion effect you are worried about um and this could have been one of those things uh, of course um and i sort of document the kind of social media anger that existed i mean people kept lighting candles and doing all of that um state media was very smart they started to co-opt that they sort of highlighted lee wen yang as a martyr before his death uh, you know there was a supreme court sort of inquiry which is sort of chastised the local leadership um and the idea is that they sort of started to adopt lee wen yang as a model party worker in some ways who you know despite the sort of problems in the system stood for the right things and subsequently of course after his death he got honored uh, you know and any time from particularly from washington if you heard any criticism regarding lee wen yang and calling him a whistleblower you saw the chinese foreign ministry constantly hit back saying he was not a whistleblower he's a member uh, of the party you have nicely stated how there is this hangover of what happened with the erstwhile ussr the 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 way the soviet model sort of you know got fragmented and that is always cited as what not to follow uh, and yeah. they always keep talking about it so so discuss that with our viewers Right. I think there's been this, particularly since the fall of the USSR, and again we have to remember that while that was happening, uh, there was a cascading dominoes of communist countries where governments were falling. Um, at the same time, China was going through its own crisis. The Communist Party of China was going through its own crisis after the Tiananmen Square crisis. So there was this deep sense of anxiety, and you needed to do something different. Uh, and the model that the Chinese Communist Party adopted was that. we need to maintain the leninist structure of the party and the party's integrity and its control over politics and the pla whereas we need to start to loosen the strings economically to be able to create far more space uh, far more wealth far more opportunities to gain performance legitimacy they did really well with that and they came to a point in 2000 instead of the first towards the end of the first decade of 2000 which is when xi jinping sort of comes to the stage uh, after the 17th party congress where he's named the successor that there is this anxiety about the nature of corruption there is this anxiety about uh, you know losing control over society about ideology weakening and not meaning anything there is anxiety about the party's strength in itself its organizational strength where you were sort of in early 2000s jiang zemin with his theory of three represent and essentially said that look the party must represent broader communities and therefore private sector gets the role in it now you're at a point where party membership is seen as route to success uh, economically and financially um, so there's deep corruption your values have eroded when shi jinping takes charge and in fact when hu jintao is going out one of the comments that he talks about is he talks about how corruption in that sense is a, could be an existential threat to the party So when Xi Jinping comes to power, he basically says, "Look, we need to focus and understand from history, and we need to focus on the ideology and the values that we have to espouse in the future, because we need to whip this party back into shape." And how he goes about doing that is, of course, centralization, maintaining control, uh, making sure that uh, cadres understand that there is an ideological battle that's going on. Um, and he, from his point of view, he's looking at the USSR as a negative example. Uh, from his point of view. Uh, the soviets uh, the party there essentially lost control of the army it started to lose control over the nature of the party in itself the organization had expanded um and those are the kinds of risks that you don't want to take where your sort of ideology has started to vanish and you know gorbachev glasnost and perestroika also included political reform and that's a no no from the communist party's experience so he starts to whip the party in shape organizationally um today the communist party is an entity uh, where you can't join so easily even if you're paying membership fees and wanting to join because there are stricter guidelines uh, down the road what he what she jinping has done and more particularly in the last 6 to 8 months what i've seen is increasingly he's made sure that ideology is the core component political loyalty is the core component for cadres at all levels um there there used to be an old debate in the communist party of china uh, which somewhat got settled uh in the 80s and the 90s uh, the idea of who do you prefer the reds or the experts uh, and that sort of contestation particularly with your impose uh, practicing in terms of policy outcomes and performance legitimacy 
Deng Xiaoping was leaning towards experts, and subsequently there was a lean towards experts. Xi Jinping has brought back redness uh, and brought it red back gene. to the bang. Sorry. They talk about a red gene these days. Exactly, they talk about inheriting the red gene. Uh, you know, uh, Xi Jinping sort of uh, just last week when he visited, when he had this Politburo meeting, he talked about how we. Uh, he talked about how he had visited just about every other revolutionary site that exists in China. So he's emphasizing ideology, he's emphasizing political loyalty, and he's whipping the party in a different, in in a shape which he thinks is far more lean, far more efficient. far more effective and far more organizationally hierarchical in the sense that they they are very responsible to the central leadership um and that's essentially his mantra of learning from the mistakes of the soviet union to be able to control the party's organization structurally um so that and that that paranoia sort of exists from the leadership's point of view because they've seen a history uh in which uh, you know in which once the sort of party loses control it sort of dissipates completely and i think again from in from an indian point of view um in our system parties can come and go governments can come and go the state still is sort of semi permanent permanent in the chinese system you can't lose an election and come back once you go you go uh, so that's sort of an existential anxiety that remains so tell us about all of that how you know the president himself intervened and managed to inject this kind of narrative right so At, at a certain point of time, it was very, very clear that action had to come from the top, um, and this happens in around sort of you know you have they sent an expert team to Wuhan uh, in sort of around January seventeenth, eighteenth. Uh, I might be a little fuzzy on the dates, and a day later that the team reaches, it sort of sends this message that look, we need to take a certain kind of action right now, um, and after that you have the sort of lockdown imposed. Now there's a lot of debate about how much Xi Jinping knew when. Um, and uh, at some point in the book i document that um, the communist party itself narrative its na- its own narrative says that xi jinping knew about this and took this very seriously at an extraordinary meeting on january 7th uh, if you knew about it if he knew about it on january 7th he didn't talk about it until much later um, and that's the first thing and why would you then wait for so long if you had taken it as seriously at that point of time now part of that can be bureaucratic inertia where you start to sort of get reports and you send teams um but part of it is also that it is your culpability that after you knew on january 7th still the wuhan sort of provincial congress goes ahead still the new year celebration in wuhan goes ahead uh, which to me is sort of surprising that that happened particularly if you knew it on january 7th the other thing is that this is sort of post facto correction by the communist party right they say this in february that he knew it in january 7th um so that's a bit of a mismatch in there how he then went up went about doing this was he created a leading group which uh, at one level li kechang was leading there was another group with sun chun lan was leading um and they were the people li kechang visited once and didn't visit again but sun chun lan was the person who was sort of repeatedly traveling to wuhan uh, making sure that the central government uh, dictates so met uh, there were certain loyalists of xi jinping who were put in charge of situations over there which just tells you that he didn't trust the local leadership to do right by things um and that's how they started to take control of things on the ground from a narrative point of view i think in very early on the communist party realizes that look if we don't address economic issues um this problem is going to be protracted um and very very early on much to their credit they start to talk about reopening and they start to talk about reopening in a calibrated manner uh, while maintaining localized lockdowns um it is there it was therefore amusing to me and also disheartening to me to see that in india when we had these lockdowns we seemingly were struggling to figure out how to reopen uh, whereas a successful playbook was evident that you could do something like that of course society is different systems are different state capacity is different uh, despite all of that at a sort of strategic level you had a playbook which had worked um, yet we were struggling to figure out how do we sort of think about this from the, from the communist party's point of view had sort of figured this out that we need to do some of this very early on and we need to make sure that employment is a key priority that is maintained uh externally we were seeing china as suddenly increasing their military belligerence you know we we heard a lot about wolf warrior diplomacy uh that you know uh, some uh, analysts sort of claim uh, 
and then for india from india's perspective it was that you know first you gave us the virus and now you have engaged our military at the border and then came 15 june 2020 when the galwan valley clash happened we lost 20 soldiers so so uh, the relationship between india and china per se has gone upside down and you know we've heard from the government calling it uh, you know they were lightening it with the 1962 war uh, we've also heard the government saying that the relationship has been severely damaged so now coming to although you've dealt with it uh, about it in your book but you're also a china expert so can you tell us uh, in in the sense how do you see this aspect of the relationship because end of the day china is your neighbor a very powerful neighbor who's in the race to become a superpower uh, how long can you uh, ignore what is it that you need to do to sort of uh, come out from this kind of you know complex web that has got created india has also aligned with the us more with quad and everything so how do you see that situation evolving now right i mean let me just first make a point on wolf warrior diplomacy i mean I, i think it was part of obviously narrative contestation where they did all sorts of things from you know latching on to incidents of uh, racism in the west against uh, people of uh, you know chinese origin or uh, east asians uh, and sort of uh, latching on to that and saying well this is the west sort of approach to us uh or they sort of made the argument that look we've sacrificed so much of the world by shutting down wuhan right. or they sort of spread disinformation uh or they sort of put the new coast guard law that the japanese got so worried about so exactly um i think that all of that was part of it and the the notion of wolf warrior diplomacy combining all of this um the notion of this assertive chinese diplomacy it has a lot to do with obviously nationalism at home um and it also has a lot to do with institutional incentives within the apparatus um it also has a lot to do with how xi jinping sees the world and at least how we understand xi jinping sees the world um he sees the world where the dynamic of power so the geopolitical gravity of power is shifting from the west to the east uh, he sees this creating volatility but he also sees uh, china being a rising power whereas the united states being a declining power in some ways he sees therefore an opportunity for china because of its economic might uh, because of its indispensability when it comes to addressing certain global issues such as climate change terrorism nuclear proliferation um, none of these you can address without having china on board he sees china centrality to the global economy um, china today comprises i think about 25 or percent of the global gdp uh, this is expected to rise going forward so he sees china therefore in not a bad position unlike how we outside may say that china may be feeling isolated because india and the rest of the west are working together uh, for xi jinping he sees opportunities of course there are challenges and there's greater volatility but there are opportunities um he also sees china as a major power now a major power that has international appeal and international clout must exercise power particularly where it feels it must and it needs to and where its interests are sort of intertwined and entangled so some of this is also greater risk tolerance um you know to try and sort of shape outcomes far more actively whether it's in ladakh whether it's in nepal whether it's in bhutan uh, or whether it's in the south china sea or whether it's in japan to try and enable yourself to do that because what use is the power if you're not going to exercise it in one way now is the exercise of power strategically judicious um the case with india says not necessarily because you pushed india far closer to the united states but if i'm sitting in beijing and i'm watching what's happening right now yes i'm of course not very happy with how close india has gotten to the united states and the fact that we've had this quad summit and the fact that india has been invited to the g7 meeting uh, and the g7 sort of makes a reference of china nato makes a reference of china none of that tells me that i'm very happy with it and i see sort of storm clouds brewing but what i also see specifically with regard to india is let's see how far can they go um they have their own interest there's an internal discourse in india uh, historically which is about do we align how far do we align is an alignment in the traditional sense being offered by the united states uh, and if it's being offered how far can india go particularly when it has deep ties with russia particularly in the defense sector mm-hmm. so manoj tell me now that they complete 100 years 
and since you uh, deal with the subject so deeply and you read all their materials what are you thinking um, their next strategy going to be look i mean I, the first thing is that uh, i i don't necessarily think that they yeah they talk a lot about long term planning but i mean look uh, politics is politics everywhere and politics is predominantly about survival and so is it in china so i don't think it's necessarily all long term planning but yes there's a lot of thinking that goes into uh how far you need to, where do you want to be um and that sort of uh, is sort of part of the party's approach where uh, how do they see the current sort of scenario evolving um they call where they're at uh something like a new development stage uh this stage comprises of intense competition with regard to uh the external environment uh whereas deep domestic challenges uh, those domestic challenges are related to you know inequality pollution uh livelihood issues uh and this sort of reflects in what Xi Jinping said at the 19th party congress that uh we redefined uh, the principal contradiction facing society which is now about not just attaining growth but actually attaining balanced growth and addressing issues of livelihood so that people can have a better life experience um and that's what they're trying to address domestically and their thought process is that if we can address those sorts of issues domestically then we will have far greater legitimacy at home so that's your sort of primary goal and the last and the biggest sort of challenge that he faces in doing what he wants to do is uh, he's not clearly designated a successor um and it seems unlikely that that's going to happen uh, next year during the 20th party congress and that inherently engenders tension and history has told us that when a leader maintains absolute power and does not take care of transition in an orderly fashion it can be chaotic once he leaves the stage and that's a huge challenge going forward for them well on that fantastic and interesting note manoj thank you so much let me show the book once again this is called the smokeless war china's quest for geopolitical dominance manoj thank you so much this is a bloomsbury publication go grab your copy and thank you for writing the book congratulations and please take care thank you thank you so much thank you so much for having me it's a pleasure Thank you.